Hey Rail fans, welcome to another video. In this video, I'm going to show you how you can set up a small temporary layout into something that's commonly called a switching puzzle or a shunting puzzle and look at some different things you can do and configurations and how you can continuously modify that to play different games and not have it be just a static thing that you're uh, repeating the same thing over and over again. I find this is a lot of fun and sometimes when I want to do something with trains but I don't really want to work on the layout, I don't want to weather more cars or do an actual operation session, I can take out some temporary track, set it up, and uh, play a quick game with this over a couple hours. And I think it's kind of fun. So I'm going to show you how I do this. So let's head on over and I'll show you how I set it up. So what I've got laid out in front of me is a switching puzzle, or possibly a shunting puzzle, that I put together. And there's a lot of very famous ones already out there, uh, such as John Allen's Time Saver puzzle, or Alan Wright's uh, Inglenook Sighting puzzle. And uh, those are great, and if you're not familiar with those, you may want to read up about them. There's a lot of websites and videos that talk about those uh, in depth. So I'm not going to cover them. but. I uh, will talk a little bit about what the uh, shunning puzzle or switching puzzle is and does, why you might want to put one together. And then I'll show you the rules that I use to both develop one and then to actually play a game with the shunning puzzle. And I really like these. I, I think they're fun, temporary things you can set up on the times when uh, I don't really want to work on the layout, but I want to do something with trains. I can snap one of these together in a couple hours and then... Uh, play a few games of it, and I think it's a lot of fun. Okay, so if you're not familiar with the term uh, switching puzzle or shunting puzzle, then uh, what it is is it's an intentional, uh, or at least I view it as an, an intentionally over complex track arrangement in order to set some uh, cars out at various sightings. And then you incorporate some set of rules that tell you what where the cars have to go or what you have to do in order to set the cars out or pick cars up or move them around. And some people play these against a clock to see how quickly they can do it. Some people play these against a number of moves and what's the fewest number of moves that you could do as far as a forward move or reverse move of an engine in order to accomplish getting all of the cars where they're supposed to go. Or some people, kind of like myself, uh, just sort of play the game for fun uh, without any actual uh, time uh, associated with it as far as uh, time, number of minutes or number of uh, moves. So again, this is not um, at all how real railroads operate. This is not an <laughs> actual railroad setup track or anything like that. So uh, don't confuse this with anything uh, prototypical, but I think it's a lot of fun uh, to sort of set up. and. I'll step you through how I actually sort of, uh, the, the things I think about as I'm putting one of these together, because I sort of make a new one every time and set them up. Because to me, a lot of the fun is figuring out what will work. How can I actually arrange the track differently, either uh, more complicated or less complicated than the, the time before? And how can I change the length of sightings or the lengths of runaround tracks to make the game more fun, or at least different? So for me, when I'm designing one of these, I generally design a style where I have some type of runaround uh, that can accommodate uh, an engine and then maybe one or two cars so that you can run around, that engine can run around one or two cars. And then I have a number of sightings, usually on uh, both sides of that runaround. And then I have um, sightings facing both directions. So not necessarily both directions on both sides of the uh, run around, but both directions. Because again, that makes it more complex. That makes it the game a little bit harder. And to me, a little bit more fun. And then you figure out, okay, once I've got that designed, then I actually just start snapping track together. Uh, I don't sit down and actually design this on uh, one of my programs uh, that I usually use for, uh, like when I'm designing a an actual layout. I just sit down at uh, the uh, work table and start snapping track together. And when I get something that I think is going to work, then I uh, play the game. So 
When I'm doing this, I snap the track together, I put a run around on, and then on the sightings, I sort of, in my mind, decide uh, what type of car is going to want to uh, spot at that uh, sighting, and how many of the cars would I want that sighting to be able to handle. Um, one, two, or up to three cars is generally the limit that I play with. And then uh, even if I'm only going to spot one car there, then sometimes you can make the sighting another car length long because that gives you some a little bit more freedom and options as you're trying to uh, move the cars around and get them to the location that they're supposed to be at. And the more excess space you have in the uh, switching puzzle, the easier it is. Because the puzzle is sort of about, you've got a, a number of cars that have to go into a number of sightings, and there's sort of no extra space. Uh, and so you're sort of in, end up moving one car at a time around the uh, switching puzzle to try and get everything where it's supposed to go. <clears throat> and then uh, when we get into the actual rules I use, there's also a number of complexities you can add in to make it uh, more challenging in addition to just the length of the various sightings. So let me show you what I've actually designed here real quick, and then I'll show you the other elements that I use to play the game. So here you can see the little switching puzzle I designed. I went ahead and built this in HO scale using Cato Unitrack. Uh, I find the, uh, the sectional track actually works quite well. The snap track kind of things work quite well for these applications, although you can use uh, any of the brands. I just happen to have Cato Unitrack that I use. And here you can see that uh, it's in uh, two foot by eight foot is the size I used. And then I also have about a four foot uh, staging area off on the side. And that allows me to sort of build my train over there and drive it into the switching puzzle before I do the switching. And then I've got sort of a main line that I, I designate. But you can see that the main line, it doesn't actually go off uh, of the other side. And that uh, is to force me to stay within the bounds of the switching puzzle. And I don't sort of cheat and, and start using that additional space. So you can see here, I've got uh, three industries sort of on the north side or at the top of the screen, north of the main line, and one industry south of the main line. And then I've got a runaround track in the middle. So you can see here the lengths of the various sightings and uh, little sections of the main line that I use and the runaround track that I use when I'm switching this out. Uh, this one's not particularly challenging in that uh, all of the sightings are a decent length and the runaround track is uh, relatively long. And so that makes the game a little bit easier to play rather than extremely challenging to play. Although you'll see when we actually play this, there's a, a significant number of moves in order to get the cars everywhere where they need to be. Okay, so now on to the game sort of portion. I'm down on the uh, end of the layout that I have set up as sort of staging, where I build up the train and then it enters the layout and then returns to this section. Again, you don't have to have this part. You can actually build the train right uh, sort of on the main line in the middle of the switching layout if you don't have the additional space to do this, and that'll work out fine as well. So, but to do this is I create a deck of cards that are uh, index cards, just three by five index cards, that have each of the types of cars that I could potentially use on the layout, and then depending upon how hard I want it to be, I will deal out myself a number of those cars. Now the longer the train is, the more cards I deal out, that will make the uh, switching assignment there harder because again, it is intentionally compressed and there's intentionally not a lot of room to do the switching assignments. And so switching out four cars is easier than five and switching and spotting those five cars is easier than six and six is easier than seven and so on. So the more cards you deal yourself or the more cars you have in your train, the harder the switching assignments will be. And there's a few other additional complexities that I'll tell you about later. But to set it up, you can actually just write on the cards the, uh, the type of car and the road number, and that'll work fine. Uh, what I actually did is I took a picture of the different cars that I'm gonna use, and it kind of blew up the road number a little bit as well. And then I pasted those, cut them out and pasted them to the cards, so that then I could deal them out and build up my train that way. So let me go ahead and do that and I'll show you, sort of step you through a quick uh, little game here from dealing out the cards to how I would spot them and the different types of things you're gonna have to think about as you're playing the game. 
First car is a box car. Tank car. Two, three, four, and five. Okay. So now you can take your cards and if you want to, you can set them out in the various sightings where they're going to go just to sort of remind you that's where they're going. Okay, so to actually demonstrate this uh, switching puzzle game, I'm not going to show you the entire thing because it's going to take too long. I'm going to speed it up some. But I wanted to show you uh, what's sort of happening as I'm moving the train around. So the upper portion of the screen will contain that uh, sort of schema schematic diagram that I showed you earlier of where the train is in relation to the, to the track. And then the lower part will show the actual train as it's moving around. And I'll try and keep it all synchronized so you can tell what's going on. And if you're wondering how I'm uncoupling my cars, I'm just using the uh, KD uh, manual uncoupling tool. And uh, I actually use that on my other layouts too because I find it uh, to be very reliable and easy to use. You may also notice that uh, I'm not really using the bell on the engine all that often. Uh, some of the moves in it that the bell should be on for, I just don't use it. It uh, For a puzzle like this, it just ends up being on basically the whole time and gets annoying to me. And so I just leave it off. And this layout, the way it's designed, uh, any box cars that I have in the train will have to be spotted first. And so this train, the way it got made up, the first car was a box car, so that's what I am spotting first. And then I'll go back and have to do a couple other moves before I can spot that second box car. So since the other boxcar is the second to last car of the train, right in front of the caboose, that's the next car I'm going to spot, but because it's so far back, I can't actually take that directly to its siding. The switch lead that's sort of the far right side of the main line that I actually use uh, will only hold the engine plus three of the cars. And since that's the fourth car back, I can't just take it directly and then uh, drop it in the tank car area and then pull it forward and put it in the box cars. So what I'm going to have to do is take one of the three cars that's in front of it and set it off by itself somewhere else before I can spot that box car. And so what I decide to do is I'll go ahead and take the first three cars forward and then put the coal car on the runaround track because I'm going to have to run around the coal car anyway so I'm going to have to move it to the runaround track at some point by itself. So I might as well go ahead and do that now, and then I'll go back with the tank car and flat car, pick up the box car, and because now I still just have three cars, I can go ahead and go through the, the same motions and movements that I did to set that first box car out, and then I'll set out the second box car right next to it.
Okay, so now I'm going back. I pick up the box car, and now because it's uh, the third car, I can go ahead and get into the uh, runaround track. However, I can't actually take it all the way up to the boxcar siding and drop it off because the siding that uh, is labeled tank cars on this isn't long enough to hold three cars. It can only hold two cars. And so what I'm going to do is actually take the boxcar and set it at the other uh, little section of the runaround track where you can park a car and then go ahead and drop the flat car and the tank car back off and then when I come back, I can then shove the box car up into its uh, siding. So near the end of this video, I'll talk about uh, things you can do to make the game a little more challenging or a little different. But certainly one of those things you can do to make it more challenging is to use a larger engine. Instead of using a real small switch engine, uh, use a larger engine, or especially like if you make a, uh, or use a steam engine with a tender on there, then that engine takes up a lot more space and that reduces the amount of extra room you have and so maybe the engine, instead of two cars in the engine fitting in a siding, maybe only one car in the engine fit in a siding. And that makes it more challenging to uh, switch out. So with both box cars dropped off, I'll now go back and instead of going back to the tank car and flat car, I'll use the runaround track to grab the coal car and then shove it up into the uh, industry for the coal cars there in the upper right hand corner of the layout. Now for my next move, I could just take the tank car and place it at its siding. However, thinking ahead a couple moves, I'm going to need to run around the caboose to get the flat car spotted properly. So what I can do is go ahead and do that move first, spot the caboose, and then put the flat car back in its location, and then spot the tank car, and that will cut down on the number of moves I have to make.
And with the caboose dropped off on the runaround track, I can now go back and spot the flat car on its siding. So the last car I'll have to spot is now the tank car. And once I'm recoupled to the caboose and then head back off into hidden staging, that ends this game. So in addition to that, there's a couple of then variations that you can add into this game. I think depending upon how different you want to make it or how complicated. Uh, the first of which, as I mentioned in the 1950s, where you have a caboose that you have to deal with, that gives an additional complication because you're not just working with the cars uh, that you're trying to set out. In addition to that, you can set um, rules that after a certain amount of time or a certain number of moves, you have to clear the main line because a uh, another train is going to pass by. And so uh, you can't leave any cars on the main line. You can also just simply make that a rule that, and that's usually what I do, is that uh, you can never spot a car on the main line of the uh, little switching puzzle, whichever track you've designated as the main line. So for me, that's what I do of when I'm moving cars around and setting them different places, I think you can't leave a car just all by itself on the main line. So you can put them other places, but you can't leave it on the main line. In addition to that, you can start the uh, switching puzzle with some cars already spotted at the industries. So in addition to, say, dropping one or two cars, like these coal cars, in addition to dropping a couple of them off, maybe there are a couple of them uh, sitting there that are empties that need to go back. And so that ends up giving you, especially in the 1950s, um, a, l a lot of additional complication because you have to get those cars out of there stick them someplace, put the new ones in, then run around those cars, have those cars run around the caboose to get the caboose at the end, and I think before then you would depart. And so just setting a couple cars out at the beginning of the switching puzzle uh, game uh, really adds a lot of uh, additional complexity to it. And you can certainly bog down one of these very rapidly with simply too many cars. So that's one of the one things I'd caution is start with actually a very few number of cars. You know, for even something as large as this, three or four cars will uh, would be enough to kind of bring in. And certainly if you're going to spot a couple cars at the sightings, three or four on a train is a lot of shunting or switching that you're going to do before uh, you actually complete the game. So additionally, you can put in, you can designate a, a section of the... Uh, layout or the puzzle as where there's a road. Now you can just fold some sheets of paper over and lay them underneath the tracks and you can have a rule that then you cannot park or set the cars out that are obstructing that uh, roadway. And so again that adds additional complexity and restrictions on where you can put the cars while you're uh, switching things out. Okay rail fans. Well, I hope you found this video interesting. Uh, if you did, don't forget to like and subscribe uh, down below. And as everybody keeps saying, uh, you can hit that little notification bell so that you'll know every time I post a new video. But hopefully you'll give this a try. Hopefully you'll enjoy it. And it's a fun way to, to kind of play with the trains 
and make a game of moving the cars around. Uh, for the times you just really want to play with the terrains, you don't actually want to do a full op session or work on weathering cars or, or building models. So with that, as always, keep running and playing with your trains, and we'll see you at the next update.